so we, 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 as we began the year, we said that this would be a year incredible or an Anna's uh, Mirabilis, a year of miracles, a year of great things. And we, we have already been told that the, in this year, we are going to hear the voice of the Father. And we, as we continue to pray, I want to encourage you not to delegate this word to others, but believe God that he will speak to you. You will have encounters with the voice of God for yourself and be a person who will routinely or will be led by God on a more regular basis, that you are not, you are dependent on the voice of God, the voice of the Father. So this is what we are believing God for. And in these sessions that we are teaching on the, um, on, on this issue of the uh, encountering the voice of God, I, I want to lay principles and teachings in your hands that will guide you and help you and will safeguard you. So in the session today, last week we talked about the why we should hear the voice of God, why God speaks to us and uh, how there is an introductory remarks. But today I want to talk about principles that govern the different manifestations of the voice of God. Um, we are going to have to split it into two. Today I will cover seven principles and uh, we have a total of 15 principles that cut across the, all manifestations of the voice of God. So today I will cover seven and then next week we will cover the remaining eight. Then we start going into the, the different manifestations of the voice of God. Hallelujah. So we, we are believing God. I pray that God will give you understanding, will give you clarity, will give you understanding of uh, these principles because these principles are critical. So to kickstart in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 19 to 21, the Bible says, this says, do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good and abstain from every form of evil. So do not quench the spirit. Allow the voice of the spirit. Allow the manifestations of the voice of God. Do not despise prophecies because there are many people who say, oh, oh if it's because there, there's been an abuse. So if anybody prophesies or if anybody says I've heard from God, people are careful because of what others have done. But at the same time, we're not supposed to just be naive. We must test all things and hold fast what is good. When he says test all things, hold fast what is good, he's saying you must be able to discern enough to reject that which is not good. Then it actually goes on to say, abstain from every form of evil. So that's what we should be doing. So principle number one is this. The, the magnitude of God's manifested power and presence in his voice is usually proportional to the significance of the purpose. In other words, many people say, oh, I want to hear God's audible voice. I want to hear, I want to see an angel. I want to see Jesus come in person. But I want you to understand that the magnitude of the manifested power and the presence in the manifestation of the voice of God is proportional to the significance of the purpose for which God is speaking. So in other words, if God speaks to you in an audible voice or in a mightily supernatural way, you had better listen because it means there is significant, there's great significance to the thing that he is speaking to you about. And because there's great significance, it also means God is so serious about it. As a matter of fact, Mike Biko said this. He said, when God communicates a purpose and a message to you with a dramatic and supernatural manifestations, then you should know that the Lord is urgent about it and he wants to apply it in your life. And if necessary, he will deal severely with you to make sure you attend to the issues. In other words, the more, the more spectacular, the more visible the manifestation of the voice of God, the more imperative it is. So God will require much more, just like the Bible says, to whom much is given much is required. So if you are given supernatural manifestations of the voice of God, you will hold you to a higher standard. You see, if you doubt me, ask Zachariah. Zachariah had an encounter with the angel. And when he doubted, the angel just said, you know what? You don't believe what I'm saying? You are going to be dumb. You are not going to be speaking. Your, your, your mouth is shut because you, you sabotage the purpose of God because it was critical. So it's important to understand that the manifestation of the voice of God, the more supernatural it is, the more critical it is, that agenda or whatever the revelation is, is to God's agenda. And God will hold you to a high standard of it, for being that voice. Put it another way. You see, you don't expect God to speak to you about anything 
that is superfluous in a supernatural in a way that is so um, patently supernatural manifestation of the voice of God. So you need to understand that the moment that voice is powerful, the moment that boy voice is very strong, you know that you are preparing for war. And sometimes, actually, the most the more he speaks to you, it may actually mean that you are going to go through a very terrible situation. And within that situation, you are going to have, you are going to doubt God. So for God to make sure that you would never doubt the experience. He makes sure that you have such a tangible, incredible manifestation of his voice so that when hell breaks loose, you will still say, but I know God. I had an encounter with God. Just like Paul, you see, when he had an, an encounter with the angel of God. So that's why he could say, let the storms rage. Let whatever happens, even when people plot to throw me off the boat, off the ship, I know I will make it to Rome because today stood by me the angel of the God whom I said. So the more powerful, patently powerful the manifestation of the voice of God, God, the more significant it is. That's one side. Or the more it tells you that you are going to go through quite some challenges. And those challenges will cause you to doubt God himself. So God is saying, I'm giving you such an experience that whatever the enemy will throw at you, you are not going to doubt that you heard from me. So that's the first principle. The second principle is what I call God's strategy of silence. You see, we, 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 God speaks to us, we hear his voice, and there are many ways that he speaks to us. But sometimes we encounter seasons in our lives when we want to hear God's voice and we are desperate for him to speak, and yet he does not speak. We are desperate for his voice, desperate for his guidance, and yet God is silent. You see, all God's generals have had to deal with God's silences because there are moments, there are times in this life when you desperately want to hear from God, and yet God will be silent. But you see, the, those times, they are deliberate because there is a time when God is silent so that he will teach you to trust him even when you don't hear his voice. So he's saying, will you trust me when there's no supernatural phenomena? Will you trust me when you are in the dark? When I give you a voice and I give you a word, I give you a mandate, would you hold on to that mandate irrespective of whatever happens? That's why the Bible says of Abraham, who against hope believed in hope. Why could Abraham do that? Because he had had an encounter with the voice of God. He had had a covenant with God. And God had spoken to him so clearly, so manifestly. So when there was a silence for 25 years and nothing was happening, he knew that this God was training him. God was equipping him. God was just waiting to say, will you trust me when there is no voice? Will you still hold on to my word when there is no confirming evidence? You look at David. David is, yes, the voice of God is anointed, but he spends years running around in the wilderness being pursued. And the God is, is almost silent as concerning that purpose of God. God. So there is sometimes God uses a strategy of silence just so that he say, will you trust me when you don't hear my voice? Will you trust me when I'm silent? You see, the Bible teaches, we, we actually understand from biblical history that from the book of Malachi to the book of Genesis, book of Matthew, prophetic voice. It was as if God was saying, I have been speaking for 2,000 years. Now, will you hold on to that prophetic word? While I am silent, will you trust me that the Messiah will come? Now, think about it. Before the breakthrough, before the coming of the Messiah, whom the whole of the Old Testament, the prophets, and they, they were talking about, but for 400 years, God was silent because that's his strategy. Sometimes he's silent just before dawn. Sometimes he's silent to see whether you hold on to his word or you are sustained by the supernatural yourself said by the voice of God, but he's saying the voice that I spoke to you is still true. You can count on me. You can hold on to me. So you must understand, you must appreciate that there are times when you will have to pass. It's just like as one of God's generals, you will pass through the seasons of the silences of God. You see, the, this is very critical and we need to understand that. So I want to say something to even to prophetic people as a, as a collateral. You know, sometimes prophetic people are too vociferous. They're too vocal. They wanted to, they, they hate silence, but God sometimes is silent. And this is what I want to say to prophetic people. You should learn to be silent when God is silent. You know, there are times when things are happening and you feel like, oh, I have to say something. And, and yet God is silent. If God has not said anything, don't say anything. It reminds me of a situation. It was, for me, it was kind of awkward. It's only that I began to understand it later on. I remember it very clearly. It's almost 12 years ago, I think, when we were, we were in the Victory Business Forum board meeting. And Pastor Tommy just decided that he wanted to re replenish the whole board. So he called the whole board and he said, guys, I want to start afresh. So I want all of you to resign. And uh, we are going to start with a new board. 
because we want new ideas and things like that. So he, so we were about eight or 10 people on that board. And he started going around the table. I remember it in the boardroom in celebration center. And he started giving prophetic words to everybody. He gave everybody. And I was close to the, I was I think the third from the last. So he gave prophetic words, prophetic words, words of encouragement and so on. And he got to me and he has given words to everybody. He looks at me for a season, for a moment. And then he says, Doc, I'm afraid I don't have a word for you. I mean, I said, what? You can imagine the build up as he gets closer. You're not saying, I wonder what God is going to say. And then he says, I don't have a word for you. I was really offended and said, how can you, how dare he? Then after me, all the other people, he gave prophetic words. So you can imagine we are in a board of about 10 people. You are the only one who doesn't have a word. So initially I was really irritated. But as I matured and I started thinking about it and I started reflecting, I actually realized that it took maturity for Pastor Tom to actually say, you know what, God is silent. I don't have a word. You could have just even taken a, a scripture from somewhere and thrown it as a prophetic word and I would just have been excited. But he had the maturity to be silent when God is silent. We have to understand that if God is not speaking and encouragement somebody, don't try to manufacture the encouragement. You see, God's silence or inactivity at a time when you badly need to hear from him is really a test of your maturity. It's a test of the maturity of the believer, but it's a test of the maturity of the leader. So you need to understand that from the understanding that the strategic silences of God, they are intentional and they are purposeful, and we should learn how to deal with those when they happen. So principle number three, let me gather speed. Principle number three is something that we all know called the priesthood of all believers. You know, the, we do understand that the big slid and check yet they started teaching people that you know what you the believers cannot hear God for themselves so they needed the priest to act as a mediator the priest to hear from God and they could not hear God for themselves but you see God restored within the reformation the reformation period he restored to the fathers of faith the concept of the priesthood of every believer and he told us that we don't need a priest to inter believers don't need a priest for to interpret God's voice for them we don't need a prophet we don't need a man of God to interpret the voice of God for us so when we talk about the year of the father's voice, you don't need an intermediary because you can hear the voice of God for yourself. We don't need a mediator between you and God apart from Jesus Christ. You don't need someone else to hear God's voice for you. You don't need God to speak to you through via via. God is going to speak to you directly and because we are created to hear the voice of God. I want you to understand in this year of the year of the voice of the father, you are part of the priesthood of all believers. You are not created to hear the voice of God second hand. We are all priestly kings. We can hear God for ourselves. So we must believe God that you can hear God for yourself. You see, but if you have to hear God for yourself, every you understand that every Christian, every believer has a responsibility, has an anointing, and has an ability to hear from God for himself. So expect to hear from God. Expect to have an encounter with the voice of God in this year and say, Father, I want to hear your voice. I'm setting myself up. I'm preparing myself and I'm positioning myself to be able to hear the voice of God for myself because I am part of the priesthood of the believers. I'm a priestly king and I'm a, or I'm a kingly priest. So that is part of what you need to understand that you have to hear God for yourself. But you see, a lot of believers have gone to an Old Testament model where they had been lied to, to say God needs a mediator who is not Jesus Christ, that believers need to hear from the prophet. They need to hear from the pastor. That's why people are always coming to pastor and say, do you have a word for me? You don't need a word from the pastor. God wants to speak to you directly because you are a priest. You have a direct line between you and God. So that's principle number three. Principle number four that I want you to understand when we talk about the voice of God is there something which I learned from uh, the former governor of the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. He is uh, Dr. Gideon Gono. You know, he was asked by some people, he says, you know, it seems like you are speaking with, with both sides of the mouth. We are not clear. We don't know what you are saying. And he says, you know what? It's called the, the, the doctrine of necessary ambiguity. So the principle number four, in terms of the voice of God, is, is what I borrowed from Gideon Gono. It's called the doctrine of necessary ambiguity. Many people will say to you, oh, you know what? When God's voice, when God speaks, when there's a manifestation of the voice of God, it's always clear and unambiguous. It's very clear. You can't miss it. And they, they say this, but I, let me ask you a question. You see, when Abraham, when God says to Abraham, I want you to leave your country, and I will take you to a, to a land that I will show you. Do, what do you think? 
when, when you, I mean, imagine with me, if you had a, a, a removal, glance removal, back up in, into the tent, and then he, Abraham arrives and says, Mama Sarah, we are moving, and we are packing everything. And then they, they pack and says, where are we going? Says, God will show me. Excuse me, you are uprooting the family to go somewhere you don't know where. Is that, is that not ambiguous? It looks, it makes unambiguous to us, but because we know the end of the story, but when God was speaking, he uses that doctrine of unnecessary ambiguity. Sometimes he doesn't give things very clearly. Think about messianic prophecies. There were little bits of things that he was speaking about, but he didn't give the full revelation at that time because he wants you step by step to, to trust him. When he gives you a little bit of the light, you walk into it. As you walk, he continues to clarify. He continues to 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 to, um, to to bring, bring clarity. But when he starts speaking, there is a doctrine of necessary ambiguity. So sometimes God takes you beyond your level of understanding, deliberately keeping his voice ambiguous because he wants you to trust him. Will you take one step at a time? You can imagine if God came to you and he told you your whole life story gave you prophetic words about everything to the end. You know, there'll be no adventure. There'll be no need for faith. But God gives you just enough light, just enough ambiguity for you to argue, just enough un, 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 in ambiguity if there's a word like that for you to move on but yet you have to keep your head in his head keep trusting him so in go so don't expect the very first manifestation of the voice of god to be completely clear and you say i know exactly i'm going to turn left turn right turn this and this and this then i arrive it's not like a gps it's one step at a time First Corinthians 13, 19, 9 to 12 says this, for we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect, First Corinthians 13, verse 9 to 12, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. So there is a seeing in part. There's a revelation in part. There's a prophesying in part. We don't have the full picture. So God uses that doctrine of necessary ambiguity. So you need to press in and continue to seek God. Continue to ask for clarity. Continue to pursue him and say, Lord, open my eyes. Give me one more light. Light more light. You see, as you walk, as you pursue God, it is step by step, bit by bit, precept upon precept. He doesn't just share the light and give you all the way. He declares the end from the beginning, but that means that the in-between is not clear. So he'll walk you through step by step. So you need to appreciate, you need to understand the doctrine of necessary ambiguity. Hallelujah. Think about even the calling of Paul. Paul is told, I have called you to be a light to the Gentiles and to even to the Jews. You stand before kings. But he didn't understand that standing before kings was not an invitation from the king to say, come to the state house or come to the palace and talk to me. He didn't realize that he was going to go in the end house. He didn't realize he was going to stand before, before all these principalities, these kings, with the, the Herod, uh, uh, Herod uh, Festus, and all these guys. He stood before them. Uh, being having been arrested, but this is part of God's doc doctrine of necessary ambiguity. So expect that at some point, the voice of God may not be totally clear, and you have to lean into him. You have to pursue him some more because he wants you to have a faith that's angered on him, not angered on the revelation. So he gives you enough revelation for you to keep your hand tightly clenched into his hand so that you keep holding on to him. So that's the doctrine of necessary ambiguity. Principle number five, you have to understand. I mean, I, I come from a medical background and one of the, the basic sciences we learned in, uh, in, 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 in medical school, one of the first things we learned was uh, called anatomy. It was a, a very interesting subject for you to know the, the anatomy or the makeup of a human body. We, we need, we, they started for us, for example, they started with, 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 with the dogs and we are, we are skinning them, we are doing this and people, then we went on, we are, we are skinning and cutting off a, what we call cadaver human bodies and as we were doing that it was really a way that we are we were doing uh, we, we are trying to understand the anatomy we're trying to understand the makeup 
of this animal that we treat. So that's called anatomy. So it's the makeup, it's the build. So the voice of God also is an anatomy. It is a structure. So you need to understand the anatomy of the revelation, the anatomy of the voice of God. Because if you don't understand that, you'll make lots of mistakes. So what do I mean by that? Let me try by explaining this. The anatomy of the voice of God is made up of three parts or the three components that make up the revelation of God or the voice of God. The first is the, the voice itself or the revelation itself, what God actually said. The second is the interpretation of that revelation. In other words, they are asking the question, what does it mean? And the third is the application of the interpretation. How do I apply what I have heard as the voice of God? Let me say that again. Three parts to the anatomy of the voice of God. It's made up of three components. Just like you have a head, a body, and legs. So you have the voice itself or the revelation itself. What God actually said. And the interpretation of that revelation. What does it mean? And then the application of that interpretation. How do I apply what I have heard as the voice of God? Let me try to put it in a, in a context that I hope you will understand. You see, many people will come and they will say, oh, God said this and this and this. Yes, the Lord say exactly that. Think about Joseph's dreams. You see, Joseph was shown. He was shown the, the, the moon and the star, and, sorry, and the sun, and the stars bowing before the sun, and the, 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 the other stars bowing before the moon, and he is shown all this. But so what he saw, the revelation itself, was that dream what he saw. Now, but that in itself, that's what God actually said. Now, the interpretation is, what does it mean? So the, 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 the brothers and the parents, they understood and they said, the interpretation of this is that you, we are going to bow before you. Now, what is the sun and the stars to do with the parents and the brothers bowing? That's the interpretation. So you need to understand both the voice itself, the revelation itself, and the interpretation. And then the application is, what do you do with that interpretation? The brothers, when they, they saw that the interpretation was, let's get rid of him. So they got the voice right. They got the interpretation right, but they got the application wrong because they wanted to eliminate him so that this reality, this revelation of God does not happen. The parents, they, they heard the voice. They interpreted it well and they applied. They say, we don't understand yet, but we are going to keep it in our hearts. We are going to treasure it until there is a manifestation. Let me put it differently. Many times people say, when they have a word of knowledge or something, they say, God told me this, 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 this. But in reality, most of the times, God has not told them that. God may show them something. He may, for example, show um, somebody with, with pain on the side. And so what they see is just the pain, somebody with pain on the side. But you find somebody who say, you have appendicitis. Why? He has interpreted that it's the side, and it's this side where there's a, an appendix. So they use that to interpret. But that was their interpretation. Okay? Then they say, if, you, if it, that's the situation, it means God wants to heal you. Then they say, you have an appendicitis and God wants to heal you. But so you can see that there's the voice, the interpretation, and the application. So when somebody comes to you and say, I heard God said this, you need to ask them, what exactly did God say? Because sometimes the interpretation of the person who is bringing the word may be wrong. And then it makes the whole revelation itself wrong. Or the application may be the one which is wrong. And then it makes the whole word, the whole, the, the, the whole revelation wrong. So you need to be clear. Let me give you an example that I, I read in a book. You see, this is what happened. A prophetic person came and said to, in, in a church setting, he was visiting a church and he said, he called a gentleman up and said, sir, stand up. And the gentleman stood up and he says, God told me that you are misappropriating fathers. And there was silence in the whole church because the brother to whom that was addressed was the church treasurer. And he was known in church circles as Mr. Integrity. So it was shocking. It was embarrassing. So people started thinking, is this guy stolen from the church and whatever, whatever. But the, this man and his pastor were very mature. So they came and they, they came to the prophetic person at the end of the service and they said, okay, can you please, we, we can't relate with the word you have spoken. Can you tell us exactly what God says? He says, oh, God told me that there's misappropriation of funds. He says, no, 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 no. I'm not asking for your interpretation, the pastor said. He says, I'm saying, what is the revelation? What did God show you? So he says, oh, I saw dollar signs above his head in question marks. So that's the revelation. That's what God actually said. That's what he saw. 
then he interpreted to say, since there are question marks about dollars, then he must be uh, uh, mishandling finances. So what does it mean was wrong? His application said, now you must repent, became wrong. So the, the pastor said, look, I, I don't receive that word. And we, we, we think you got something wrong. Six months down the line, the gentleman, his business went, went under, only to discover that his senior manager was swindling the company. So the intention of God's revelation was to warn him to say, is there is swindling happening in your company. But because the prophetic person gave an interpretation instead of going to God and say, God, what does it mean? So he could have just said, you know what? There's something to do with your finances. I saw question marks around the area of your finances. God is not showing me what it is, but I want you to pray. It's not unusual for someone to say, God is not showing me what it is. Do you remember Elijah saying, Elisha saying, you know, this woman is, uh, is, is a burden of heart. This is what God is showing me, but he has not revealed it to me. So the interpretation may not be clear. When that happens, you must be able to say to that person, you know, this is what God is showing me. Don't give your own interpretation unless you're sure it is of God. And then you need the application. So for a revelation of God to be through a prophetic word, a word of knowledge, and all those things, you need to understand the anatomy of God's voice. You need to understand the voice itself, the revelation itself. What actually did God say? Number two, the interpretation of that revelation. What does it mean? And number three, the application of the interpretation. How do I apply what I've heard from God? So all three aspects of that anatomy should be true for that word to be true. Hallelujah. I hope these principles are helping you and they are bringing clarity. Principle number six, as we wind towards the seventh and we close. Principle number six, you see, God's voice is open to judgment. In other words, you should, when there's a manifestation of the voice of God, you should judge that voice. I know, I, I remember hearing uh, somebody say, you know what, when God speaks, you must just act immediately, right there. Don't wait to think, don't even think, just act immediately. No, 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 that's not true. The moment you do that, you are ready to be deceived. So whenever the Bible says every prophetic word should be tested, should be judged, so you must have your presence of mind and be able to judge the manifestation of the voice of God. If somebody comes and says, oh, I heard from God, I remember somebody who came and they were talking about, and then they described how they had a voice from God. They even saw a dream and somebody died. They went to the mortuary and they, they, the person rose, uh, rose up and they, they started speaking. And this person was actually talking as if the person came as a ghost and they were speaking to them. And at that point, people were believing that story. But I want you to understand, the moment you have something that is that crude, you must be able to say, no, 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 that's not the voice of God. Because we must always judge. The, the voice, whatever manifestation of the voice of God is open for to judgment. So you should judge the fruit of the voice. You, you should judge its message. You, in other words, you're saying, what is its effect? What is its impact? What is the effect of this voice? Here is an example. I mean, I, because this is kind of a closed session, although I know it, it will go public. But you know, the, I, I saw one prophetic preacher in the prophetic in courts. I would actually want to say a, a, a false prophet, a prophet in a sense. A, from Nigeria, who was uh, praying for people and so on. And I saw something crazy. And that's the last time I saw him the first time and said, I'm not going to watch this guy. This is not of God. Because every time he prayed for ladies, when they fell, their dresses were all over. There was indecent exposure and their cameras will actually zoom in and the, the dress. And I'm saying that there's something dirty about this. I mean, when somebody is slain in the spirit, when men do, they, they almost fall appropriately. But when ladies are slain, they, they, they have to indecently expose themselves. What is wrong? So the effect of that manifestation told me that this is not from God. And I said, no more. The, the, the later on, we then began to discover a lot of other things about that person. So you need to judge the effect or the fruit or the impact of that voice. Number two, you also ask yourself, does this voice lead to godliness? Because any manifestation of voice of God leads to godliness. It leads to repentance. It leads to closeness to God. Is it glorifying God? Does it lead to condemnation? Or does it produce godliness? So these are the questions you ask when you look at the manifestation of the voice of God. You need to have the clarity. So the voice of God should be judged because every manifestation of the voice of God should always agree with the scripture. It can never contradict the written word of God. In principle, in character, 
and in the exact scripture. I say that again. Any manifestation of the voice of God, whether it's an angelic visitation, whether it is the manifestation of Jesus himself, whether it is a dream, whether it is a vision, whatever it is, it must always agree with the scripture. It should never contradict the written word of God in principle, in character, and in the exact wording of the scripture. So that is very important. And you should never be put in a position where you're told, no, 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 it's the voice of God. Don't think about it, just act. The other thing that you need to understand is that the manifestation of God's voice is always consistent with the character and the spirit of Christ. I think I mentioned it last week to say you need to judge it according to the character, the nature, and the spirit of Christ. So what we are saying is that the manifestation of God's voice needs to be checked also for tending. In other words, the tending is where the tending from the human agency. In other words, if I have a bias, I, I may say something that is coming from my bias. It may some, become something from my personal sin. You know, there are some people who are always giving prophetic words that are of a, it's almost like of a sexual nature, of an immoral nature. When you begin to see somebody say the prophetic words that are painted in a certain color, it is a tainting from the human agency. Or it may be tainted because of theological baggage that somebody is, because they believe a certain way, they have a theological background, and because of that background, they will judge people. For example, somebody may come and say, the abomination, abomination in this church because you are allowing, God is saying God is angry, he is not because he is allowing, you, you guys are allowing a woman preacher, because the Bible says you should not preach, and the, that says the Lord God is judging this church, now you begin to understand that that is, that word is tainted by theological baggage so you need to ask yourself is the root of this, is there any tainting is there a bias, so you need to judge the spiritual tone and the effect of that spirit of prophecy as well, is it a harsh is it critical? Is it judgmental? Is it condemning? Because you know the nature and the spirit of Christ is not a harsh, it's not critical, it's not judgmental, it's not a put down, it's not condemning. So these are ways in which you judge a manifestation of the voice of God. So you, as the Bible says, you must also check the fruit of the messenger's life. That's why personally I try to avoid to being prayed for or to have prophetic words from people I don't know their history, where they're coming from. This is what the Bible says in Luke chapter 6, verses 43 to 45, and I'm going to read it. It says, for a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a br bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it's possible that somebody will give a prophetic word or a revelation or a word of knowledge that is tainted by the fruit that is in their heart. So we need to check those people. We need to check and see what is happening. So, and finally, in terms of judging the, the prophetic word or the revelation, you must always ask, does this word resonate in me through the inward witness? Is there a check or a scratchy feeling in my spirit? Am I resonating? Am I, am I sensing that this speaks to where I am? Those are the ways in which we judge. And finally, principle number seven. There is a need. Remember, we, we say that do not be hurried in terms of a prophetic word or a revelation. Similarly, principle number seven comes from there. Say, if you are not sure and you about this word that you're saying, I'm not so sure whether it is God or not. You should be able to ask God for independent confirmation. You see, God will confirm his word. He does not mind confirming his word. So don't just rush. If, the, if there's doubt, either you pack it or you say, Lord, I'm not going to move until you give me clarity, until you confirm this word. Because if God speaks to you and you are not clear, you should not move until you have confirmation. Don't act on something that is that you are not sure about. God is not angry when you ask for confirmation. He loves people who desire clarity before they move on. So it is very important. Like I said, God does not mind confirming his revelation to us. So when you are not sure whether the revelation from a manifestation of God's voice is from God or not, do not hesitate to ask him for further confirmation. That is important. You should not execute on a revelation that you have doubts about. Don't move. Don't be manipulated. Don't be put under pressure. Matthew 18, 16 says, this, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word of God may be established. So you can go back to God and say, Lord, I have heard, give me one more witness. Give me two more witnesses. Can you confirm it with scripture? Can you confirm it from an independent source? When you have that, now it gives you the boldness to move on 
and do that which God is calling you to do. So those are the seven principles that I wanted to lay on the table for us today. And I hope you find them useful. I hope you find them beginning to help you see how, you, how to deal with God, how to deal with the things that he says when he speaks to us. So that is what I'm saying, seven principles. We have eight more principles that we are going to cover next week. So I want you to, as soon as this uh, video is up and is loaded up, I want to challenge you. I moved very quickly on those seven principles, but this is very critical. It applies to all forms of the revelation that you hear from God. And I want you to go and study it and search it and begin to have clarity. And once you have this clarity on principle level, you will not be manipulated. You will not be abused. You will not be intimidated. So that is very important. So I just want to pray as we close. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you, Father, you, you are going to confirm your word. You are teaching us, Father, on truth. You are teaching us on principles in the name of Jesus. So I thank you that you are helping your people to come to a point. Father, what they, when they search the truth, Father, they test all things and they hold on to that which is good. They abstain and they avoid that which is evil. I thank you for clarity. I thank you for revelation. I thank you for insight. I thank you for wisdom. That is your people, as we hear the voice of God, as we hear the voice of the Father in this year. Father, I thank you that we have clarity. Father, I thank you that these principles are going to guide us in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you so much. Amen. God bless you. Back to you, Deacon Moore.